On the phone, it's a pleasure to welcome to the program Dave Nywert. He is the author of several books, uh, including his latest, And Hell Followed With Her, a uh, blogger at Crooks and Liars, and has relaunched Orsonus, which I just realized, you know, for the first time in my life I pronounced correctly, and, uh, and, and that goes for the killer whales as well. <laughs> Dave, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, Sam. Yeah, I, we, we, we love killer whales out here in Seattle, so. I understand. Um, so, <laughs> all right, so let's... Um, uh, uh, let's dig into this. I mean, uh, you and I have talked about this, uh, the, your book in the past, but um, I don't know that uh, we've done it on this program. The book came out in March, uh, and it it really, um, it, it basically follows the trajectory of the Minutemen movement, if you could call it that, from before, from, from whence it came and from where it went, uh, and and uses, of course, the uh, the story of Shauna Ford uh, as um, a, as a centerpiece. Tell us first. Uh, let's start. We, we tell us who Shauna Ford is, I guess, and uh, was. Well, uh, Shauna Ford is a woman currently on Arizona's death row, uh, but she was a, a woman from up here in my neck of the woods, Everett, Washington, uh, who got all caught up in the Minutemen movement back about two thousand six when they started doing, um, uh, as a way to prove that they weren't racist, they started doing border watches up here on the Canada border. And Shauna got all involved in them up there and wound up going down to Arizona and in the process of uh, uh, trying to uh, carry out her plans to develop a sort of super militia on the border, she wound up murdering a, a family down there. And so she is on death row for that now. Um, but yeah, the, it is. It really is my investigative work on the Minutemen, uh, where they came from, and uh, how they pulled in somebody like uh, Shauna Ford, and uh, where they where they went. Uh, I, you know, we're still living with their legacy today. Yeah. Let's before we get to um, uh, where they went. Let's 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 talk about from from whence they came, because there was certainly, uh, and and I want you to talk about this as well uh, when. During the the height of the, the sort of the Minutemen glorification, uh, there was a real sense that this sort of uh, this movement came out of you know uh, nothing but a response to a real uh, desperate problem. I mean, uh, you know, it's funny we, we don't hear this much anymore, but I remember back in the day on Air America getting calls from people saying like, "You have no idea the carnage that's going on down here in the Southwest," um, yeah. and it was all part of that. But but in fact. There really was no carnage going on down there, and this was not uh, something that sort of uh, developed out of out of thin air, like uh, like uh, much of the right wing. It was just sort of a repackaging. Well, there there was a problem on the border, uh, undoubtedly, because there were millions of people coming flooding over through that desert land, and and they were crossing people's ranches, and uh, uh, it was a real disruption. A lot of that had to do with the fact that. Uh, we had policies that were forcing these people out into the desert. But um, it, it, that said, there was a lot, also a lot of fear back then, and a lot of it was whipped up by these guys doing border militias. I mean, uh, really, the idea for doing border militias came from a guy named Glenn Spencer, who was agitating for this stuff out of California back in the 1990s. And Spencer's outfit... Uh, was designated a hate group by the Southern Poverty Law Center back in the 90s because it was so overtly racist. Um, and he moved to Arizona in about 2002 at about the same time that Chris Simcox, the co-founder of the Minutemen, uh, decided to start this up. He actually also got the idea from Simcox, did not for just from Spencer, but from an earlier border militia outfit called Ranch Rescue uh, that operated down there in the Arizona area. Uh, Ranch Rescue got put out of business because they actually uh, detained and harassed uh, Latino border crossers that they caught and wound up being taken to court for it. So, um, but 
at any rate, uh, you know, this stuff came from the far racist right for many years. I mean, uh, Spencer got his ideas from David Duke's Klan Border Watch that happened back in 1980, um, and he just melded it with the Patriot Militia Movement of the 90s and started advocating for these border militias, and that was where the idea came from. And and um, and, 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 and Simcox picked up on this, and then... Uh, Jim Gilchrist wandered along and said, let's take this national. Let's not just have it be uh, little local militia cells out watching the border. Let's have everybody from across the nation come down here and do a mass demonstration. Now, I mean, when when you talk about the policies that basically started to drive, um, uh, in particular, Mexican campesinos uh, across the border, just go back and remind people what those policies uh, were. And I'm also curious as to whether or not the, that the, those policies, um, uh, you know, that Spencer was reacting to uh, a, a new flood of immigration or just simply uh, was looking around California and just really had a problem with uh, Latino folks. Yeah. Uh, well, of course, the problem, real problem was that it was NAFTA in the end. That was the bottom line of what drove this, because NAFTA... Um, we forced the Mexicans to change their constitution so that their corn farmers no longer had uh, protection from American competition from American corn. And so suddenly these Mexican corn farmers were um, unable to compete with cheap American corn, and it put over a million farmers in Mexico out of business within just a few years of, a couple of years of the passage of NAFTA. And it, it that was just the beginning of the downturn in the economy. You know, part of the whole promise with NAFTA was that um, a lot of jobs would, you know, GM and Ford would move their plants down to Mexico. And they did that initially, but it only lasted for a couple of years because within a few years of those plants moving to Mexico, uh, they had up and taken <laughs> taken flight to Asia. And so the, the promised... Uh, compensation and increases in manufacturing job proved to be a mirage. And so you had literally millions of people thrown out of work in Mexico and the whole Mexican economy did a massive downturn. And, you know, these are people, these are human beings like anybody else, and they're trying to feed their families. And when you have to feed your family, you figure out a way to do it, even if it involves crossing a border illegally. Yeah, and we were told there was going to be all sorts of, uh, after the initial passage of NAFTA, we were told there were going to be all sorts of labor protections and environmental protections. Right. Uh, that part of the package never arrived. And like you say, no. uh, an ear of corn, uh, a Mexican uh, corn, costs twice as much in Mexico than an American ear of corn. Uh, and so these guys go from the, the, the country into the city, and they have no jobs there, and that, you're right, they, they, what else, what other choice did they have? Now, was, when, you know, you mentioned that there was a, there was a, a, a tremendous flood of, immigra- of immigrants across the border at that time. Was there as much violence as we were led to believe? No, and not as much violence, um, although it, get, it has gotten bad uh, with the uh, incursion of the cartels into the human smuggling business. Originally, this was all done, you know, with mules or, you know, just people out there who um, did border crossing as a, as a way of life and business um, and would guide people. And then the cartels got involved, and there has, so there has been, I mean, definitely an increase in uh, acts of violence, mostly involving border crossers down there, but very little violence. Uh, involving people who actually live on the borders. You know, they they were having to um, deal with people, you know, coming through their land and asking for water and stuff like that a lot more, and in a lot of cases uh, breaking uh, through fences and letting their cows out and that sort of thing. Um, but, yeah, the, everyone jumped all over. There was the, the case of the rancher down there who was killed by supposedly a border crosser, although that's, uh, still never been the case has never been solved, but there were a lot of assumptions in that case, and it was assumed that it, you know he um, encountered somebody who you know was probably a drug mule or something like that and shot him. Although now investigators believe that the person who shot him is actually uh, living in the United States, a United States citizen, and it's not a border crosser. So, um, but that's but that never got really reported very much. 
and you know the, those cases and that case still whipped up a lot of fear it was really wildly overblown in the press um and and blown wildly out of proportion not just in the Arizona press but in the national press it got played all over Fox News the Robert Krantz murder but um that was and it's worth comparing the, the amount of attention and press that that case got compared to the murder of Brisenia Flores, which was a very minimal attention by the, both the Arizona and the national press. All right. Well, before time, so. before we get to actually the the the, sto- the that that the specifics of that story, just give me a sense of uh, just why you think um, the Minutemen were so easily. Um, I mean, I guess you know this became a uh, just a uh, uh, sort of a phenom that uh, you know was sort of the foreshadowing of 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 the sort of the the Tea Party. I mean, there, it, it's a our our our, our press certainly has a a penchant for these sort of right wing extreme uh, movement. Yeah, uh, well, nativism has always been a right wing phenomenon, and. Um there have always been nativist elements within the the mainstream Republican Party. But now they've pretty much really risen to the fore, and the Minutemen had a lot to do with that. It's important to remember that, you know, when we talked about immigration before the Minutemen came on the scene, we really, the, the discussion really revolved around the number of people who were in the United States, not the actual people who were crossing the borders much. And what the Minutemen did was that they really focused the whole, made the whole immigration debate change to be about the supposed border security issue. And and this is what we're still living with today, is that this fetish about border security really was begun with the Minutemen. And it was pretty funny because, I mean, Chris Simcox, the co-founder of the Minutemen, would go around and say things like, well, I've seen uh, United Nations uh, troops massing on the other side of the border. I can't help but believe these are Chinese troops ready to invade the United States. And, you know, talking about, they were talking all about, uh, constantly about terrorists crossing the border from Mexico because after 9-11 we got to secure our borders. Well, of course, this was kind of the point of doing, when we would ask him, well, why not do border watches in Canada? Then, because that's where we actually had a terrorist cross the border back in 1999. Right. And he'd think, well, well, we'll do those border watches. And so, so sure enough, the following year, they set up these Canada border watches, which I attended. And uh, you'd go out there and you'd talk to these people watching on the Canadian border. And you'd ask them, well, what are you watching for? <laughs> they were, you know, they weren't watching for Canadians. They were watching for reporters like me. Uh, that was what they were out there to catch. Just as those reporters, just as the border watchers down in Arizona were, uh, really, they weren't there to catch border crossers. They were there to get attention from the media. And in fact, the media back in April 2005 actually outnumbered uh, the border watchers. Uh, you know, there were only about 150, maybe 200 border watchers down there. And there were about 250 or 300 people from the media there to cover them. Was it, was it, went on. And of course, you would never have known that from actually watching the coverage at the time. But anyway, uh, Simcox set up these Canada border watches as, uh, the following year as a way of proving that they weren't racist. And you'd go up there and you'd talk to these people, and what they were angry about was Latino border crossers in Mexico. They didn't care about Canadian border crossers. So if you got stationed <laughs> up in Canada, were you like, I'm hoping to get bumped up to see some real action? Or what, what, I mean, what was the <laughs> attitude of these people? Oh, no, they were. They knew that they were out there to make a point. That they knew that they were out there. It was a sort of uh, form of street theater for them, um, and they understood the game. And, so. and you know, I mean, what? Just how? You know, how cynical were these people? In other words, was this really? Was this about getting cash? Was it simply about sort of promoting uh, native of nativist viewpoints? And this was just sort of the best yeah. way in which to do it. I mean, um, or, or uh, were there some people who were genuinely concerned that, like, look, uh, you know, uh, if the feds aren't going to protect us from uh, Latino terrorists uh, coming from Canada, who, you know, I got to do it. I think that that I think the latter was actually the mess of people that I encountered up there. They were well-meaning, sincere people who who bought the 
right-wing propaganda about uh, border crossers uh, and, board, and the necessity to uh, stand up for America, uh, they'd buy it hook, line, and sinker, and so they would show up there, well-meaning people, uh, for the most part, um, who were actually, and their concern was that, you know, America was being changed forever by illegal immigration. Um, and that was what Shauna Ford, uh, the main character in this book, uh, showed up at these Canada border watches for, too. I mean, she really believed she was going to save America from illegal immigrants. And to, um, to the extent that she thought there was such a problem that uh, she basically started a criminal enterprise uh, to fund her activities. Yeah, yeah. She Well, she right, rose pretty quickly in the ranks of the Minutemen, uh, too quickly for the local guys here who... Um, who she got into conflicts with, but Chris Simcox uh, promoted her to the leadership of the state here in Washington and then uh, turned around the, a couple months later. They fired her in short order, and um, she went off and formed her own organization at, called Minutemen American Defense. And what she did by then, Simcox and Jim Gilchrist, the other co-founder, had actually become rivals. Um, they no longer cooperated and actually hated each other's guts. <laughs> and, were, so, and they'd become sort of uh, rivals for the same sort of recruits that uh, each wanted. And Shauna essentially threw in with the Gilchrist faction. And Gilchrist basically made outsourced all of his border watch operations to Shauna and her, her little outfit, which she called Minuteman American Defense, and uh, would promote, you know, Mad's activities on the web on his website. And whenever anybody uh, approached him about, well, how can I go do a border watch? Uh, he would direct them to Shauna. And in fact, that appears to be how she met the gunman in, in these murders, Jason Bush. Uh, it, it appears that she was uh, introduced to Bush by. None other than Jim Gilchrist. So, so now when these when these uh, different factions develop, I mean, is it is it I mean, w w is it just personality or is it just you know, I you know, I was part of this Minuteman organization, but they really just don't seem to hate Latinos enough, uh, and they sort of were just a little bit too pro Canadian. So I'm going to start my own more hateful hate group <laughs> or something. You know, a lot of it had to do with the huge egos that that this movement attracted. The movement itself was bound to attract a lot of dysfunctional people because it was itself kind of, it, it was kind of a psychopathic appeal. It was all, you know, totally devoid of empathy for other people. For other people. Uh, it's all about scapegoating uh, a vulnerable minority. It's all about, um, you know, blaming other, uh, blaming other people for all the nation's problems. And also incredibly paranoid and angry, uh, bellicose and all those kinds of things. So they naturally attracted bellicose, angry, paranoid uh, uh, men who not only who suspected each other's motives constantly, um, and were you know they they it barely had begun in April of 2005 before that whole movement started falling apart. But and, and that's kind of the the story of nativism in this country in general. I mean, that was true of the Ku Klux Klan back in the 1920s too, and and the Know Nothings back in the 1860s. That that they couldn't keep together because they were so they were so internally dysfunctional, and, and a lot of that is a part of the end of that whole arc of things is that it once you have you develop a sort of critical mass, and then these things splinter apart. And then the splintering apart, the smaller factions that result are always more radical and violent and dangerous. And that is indeed what happened with the Minutemen. And, and that's because they have to compete for really the the, the crazy factor. Is that it? I mean, there's yeah, a, yeah. the yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, it's a you know, it, I guess the old adage that hate can bring you together, but it, but you really need to have some trust to make the relationship work, uh, yeah. long term. Uh, so, all right. Well, so so tell us uh, briefly um, what um, um, the Shauna Ford uh, and the story of her uh, basically uh, assassinating uh, Junior Flores and his and his daughter uh, Brisena. Um, and, 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 and this was the beginning of the end 
of at least the brand, right? I mean, uh, is it? Yeah. Uh, well, it, of course, the movement had been in a state of constant decay, really, since April 2005. Uh, and by spring of 2009, it was it was still limping along. Uh, you know, they still had you still had these Minutemen organizations, and they were still doing occasional border watches down there. And particularly, Shauna was doing border watches down there. And she had come up with this idea. She wanted to buy a ranch there on the Arizona border and use it as a sort of training compound for a super militia that she envisioned of of super minutemen, you know, who were going to go out and train with night vision goggles and high-tech gear. And, and they were going to finance. She wanted to finance all this. She actually outlined this plan to Jim Gilchrist in, I think, 2007. Uh, she wanted to do it by uh, ripping off the drug cartels, hitting the drug houses and taking their drugs and money and using that money to buy land and buy uh, their guns and equipment with. And, you know, she had this in the back of her mind, but, of course, she really never was able to come up with very any kind of money to do it uh, and really didn't have any idea of where to begin as far as hitting the drug cartels. She came back to Everett, Washington, in uh, fall of 2008 and found that her husband, John Ford, was divorcing her uh, after eight years. Uh, and John was her fourth husband. And he just had enough of her being completely gone from the relationship. And that, you know what? That was fine with Shauna because the marriage was over. But um, she, in talking with the lawyers, determined that uh, you know if John died intestate, uh, she stood to gain about half a million dollars, which would solve all of her money problems. And so three days before Christmas of 2008, she had her boyfriend, her new boyfriend, go over to John's house, and he shot him five times. And uh, John, inconveniently, though, uh, survived and uh, was in a coma for a month and a half. And in the meantime, the Everett police completely botched the case. I mean, John got on the phone with the dispatcher and said, Sean Ford did this to me. And um, But he was unconscious by the time detectives arrived on the scene. And they interviewed Sean for a couple of hours and then... Uh, let her go, and then she uh, pulled. She hung around town for a couple more months, and then disappeared back down to Arizona. And when she did, she um, went back to her plan A and hooked up with a cartel guy down in the town of Aravaca, Arizona, uh, named Albert Gaxiola. And and Gaxiola was a small-time uh, cartel gopher. But uh, and he had a local guy in town that he a competitor who he wanted to get rid of named Junior Flores, and so Shauna fell into his lap with this plan to uh, rip off the cartel drug houses, and uh, she was looking for targets, and boy, he he knew exactly the target he wanted her to hit, and that was the home of Junior Flores, and he, they told her that they, they, there was like three million dollars in drugs and money in this house, and she believed it. Um, but actually, it was just his private home. Junior Flores was a marijuana smuggler. He had been in. The, he came from a longtime family down there that had been uh, smuggling across the Mexican border since the 1870s. So came, that was their line of business. And you have to understand, down there in that little town off in the middle of nowhere, the smuggling has very much been a way of life since the 1870s, and people live around it, and it's part of the scene. And so locally, Junior was just a local businessman. He was pretty well regarded. And his wife was uh, very well known. She worked at the local grocery store. And these two little girls that he had were um, much beloved. And uh, these so these guys walked into, uh, burst into their house at uh, after midnight one night, pretending to be Border Patrol, uh, and uh, shot Junior, and then shot his wife, Gina but she wasn't shot fatally. She laid on the ground and pretended to be dead. And the daughter, nine-year-old daughter, who was in the living room, woke up at that time that uh, Junior was being shot and and started pleading for her life, and uh, eventually they shot her uh, after they ascertained that the second daughter was not in the house. She was sleeping with her grandparents that night. So, um, and then, so Gina, the... Uh, the wife got up and called 911 when she thought these guys had left. And you can hear the 911 call with uh, when Gino got up because uh, uh, about a half a minute into the conversation, Shanna Ford walked back into the house 
to retrieve the AK-47 that Albert Gaxiola had left sitting on the kitchen stove. And um, she, you can hear her shout, you know, they're coming back in, they're coming back in. And she ran into the kitchen, grabbed a pistol that Junior had left sitting on the counter there, um, collapsed in a heap in the corner because she had been shot in the leg and um, huddled in this corner. And then when Jason Bush came back in to try to finish the job, she fired back, uh, managed to graze uh, Jason Bush in the leg. He ran howling from the house and leaving a lovely DNA trail for detectives to find the next day. So they had these people uh, in jail within about two weeks Mm. once they had tracked them down. And 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 then uh, everyone's trying to to run from the uh, the moniker Minuteman. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, both Simcox, Sim, Chris Simcox, tried to pretend that he had chased her out of the out of the uh, Minuteman organization when, in fact, uh, he had pleaded with Shauna and tried hard to keep her within the, his organization. And then Jim Gilchrist turned around and said, "Oh well, we just had minimal contact with her." Um, which was just a bald-faced lie. I mean, the last thing Shauna did before she got arrested in, down at Glenn Spencer's ranch uh, was she sent off an email to Jim Gilchrist to talk about their plans for that fall and the border watchers that they were going to do in the fall. Um, so, you know, it, it, she was in almost daily contact with, with Gilchrist and, uh, both, by either phone or email. Um, so, so so what happens to the energy that surrounded the Minutemen? I mean, it it, it I mean, uh, the did these people who were sort of associated with this movement they just sort of merge into the Tea Party? I mean, it it's it's interesting that in the course of of uh, the uh, I mean, I guess to a certain extent, the reason why we don't hear as much about these type of patrols on the uh, border is because. Border crossings are, uh, at least, a, you know, relatively speaking, at a, at a at a very serious low ebb. I mean, the net of uh, of uh, immigrants coming from Mexico seems to be uh, net negative at this point, uh, even though yeah. we're now sort of debating immigration or, or or have been. Well, the I mean, basically, the Republican position you hear now is the Tea Party position on immigration, and that's that we must secure the borders first before we can allow these 12 million people to become citizens. Uh, and the only way it seems, <laughs> when you ask them, well, what do you mean by securing the border? Apparently, it involves uh, building a fortress-like fence along the entire Mexican border and staffing it every 20 yards with, with somebody and, and placing uh, stormtroopers in every port. You know, uh, that, that's the nearest thing. As near as I can tell, that's what they mean by securing the borders, because that seems to be what they propose. I mean, they've, the Senate bill that, that emerged, one of the reasons it's so flawed is that it so heavily militarizes the border is the process in the process of trying to get enough Republican votes. Uh, and they're spending billions and billions and billions of dollars. I mean, something like uh, they're starting out with just $45 billion to try to build this fortress-type fence along there and increase the staffing on the border. And, you know, uh, of course, it's very telling that they only want to do this on the Mexico border. Right. When they talk about securing the border, they're only talking about the Mexico border. But in fact, when, you know, when, if you're talking really about national security and border security, the border that's far more problematic has always been the Canadian border. But um, that, but not for these people, because what they're more concerned about is the invasion of brown people. <laughs> really, that's I mean that that's what when you hear them talk about border security, it's just a, a rubric. It's just code word for keep out the brown people. Uh, but at, at any rate, yeah, the, a lot of these uh, Glenn Spencer, you know, is leading as a leading figure in the Tea Party down there in Arizona. He brings in Sheriff Joe Arpaio and Russell Pierce and all these guys, um, and they have they they have Tea Party barbecues down there at Glenn's Ranch and stuff like that. And it's all about. I mean, this is basically the old Minutemen position has been adopted in whole by the Tea Party. Uh, it's, their two positions are indistinguishable. 
And because the Tea Party runs the House, that's basically the position of the mass number of Republicans right now. Is this is what this position on the border that was concocted by these nativist Minutemen. Yeah. So it's a really an unhealthy situation because, you know, nativists, they don't really propose solutions. They, in fact, seem to propose problems. But so. now, now, but I mean, to look at this sort of, uh, you know, the, the, the silver lining here, I mean, uh, you know, we have obviously had these uh, nativist movements in this country uh, f- for as long as this country has existed. Uh, and is the is the good news that um, it is much harder to enlist people into the sort of the violent um, uh, the the into the sort of uh, translating these beliefs into violence versus rhetoric? I mean, are we seeing this? Are we seeing it watered down in some way? Well, what what, they, what happens actually is. Um, uh, the other shoe on what's happened with the Minutemen is that, yes, they do get watered down, but they also become more virulent and violent in the process. Um, there are no more Minutemen down there. Uh, there are still some border militias, uh, but they don't call themselves Minutemen because that brand name has been permanently tainted by by Shauna Ford. Now they take off names like Patriot Border Alliance and and they have various, you know, border watch names, but none of them use the name Minuteman anymore. Uh, and inevitably, these tend to be very small outfits. Uh, I mean, one of Sheriff Joe Arpaio's deputies recently got into a drawdown with a couple of these militiamen down there in the border area and around Gila Bend. And I'm getting word from the folks that I know who work in Arizona on the border that there are actually is still a significant amount of border militia activity going on down there, but it's all these small guys, and they're all much more radical. They're much more dangerous because they don't have a national organization that they're answerable to anymore, right? They just have themselves. And they can go out there and, and hunt immigrants all they like, and that's apparently what they're doing. Um, so th- they actually seem to – there's, I think – going. Uh, uh, in some ways, the problem is worse because it's not people. The people who are out there on the border now aren't just uh, sitting out in chairs and trying to get reporters. They're out there uh, with guns and scopes and, and looking for people crossing the border. Right. Well, uh, <clears throat> Dave Nywert, author of Hell Followed with Her, Crossing the Dark Side of the American Border. I really appreciate you taking the time uh, today to talk about this uh, uh, really uh, impressive piece of work. And uh, I appreciate um, hearing from you. Hey, thanks so much for having me on, Sam. It's always good to talk.